Hello and welcome. I'm Adele Gautier from Breast Cancer Foundation and tonight we're talking about dealing with DCIS. Before we get started, some housekeeping. I encourage you to make the most of the chat box. At the bottom of, the, of your screen, you'll see a task bar or a status bar. If you can't see it, you might have to move your cursor down to that area to make it appear. On that bar, you'll see a chat icon. Click on that to open the chat box. And if you have any technical issues, type details there and our support team will get in touch. You can also use the chat box during the webinar to ask questions, which we'll get to later, and you can chat to other people there. Don't worry about missing out on information while you're chatting. The webinar is being recorded and will be available on our website tomorrow. You should be able to see us panelists in a small box on your screen. There are some size bars just above that if you want to make it bigger or smaller. So tonight we're talking about DCIS, an early form of breast cancer that affects hundreds of New Zealand women every year. We have three panelists who are going to share with you. A patient, Lorna Sabritsky, Dr. Richard Harmon and Nurse Melissa Warren. First, we're gonna hear from Lorna. Some of you will know her by her lovely voice, which you can hear during daytime on Coast FM. Lorna was diagnosed with DCIS in 2015. Lorna, tell us about that and what happened next. Thanks, Adele. Um, yes, so breast cancer, I'm gonna start before then actually. Um, <laughs> breast cancer has always been talked about in my family because uh, my father's mother died at 41 years of age uh, of breast cancer after a double mastectomy. My dad was only 12 and she was a solo mum. So as you can imagine, that affected his life hugely. And even now he's 83 and he can't talk about his mum without tearing up. Um, so he's always, I'm the only girl in the family. I've got three brothers. So he's always been uh, quite um, adamant that I should be vigilant uh, with uh, breast cancer. Um, I have had two cancer scares uh, previously. I found a lump at 22 and I decided that was it. I was going to die. Um, <laughs> I'd written myself off <laughs> before I'd even been to the doctor and I, um, I had a biopsy and it turned out to be absolutely fine. Nothing to worry about. That's great. Uh, at 43, I found another lump and this was more concerning to me. It, it was hard, I, you know, it, it felt sinister. So again, I had um, a number of, um, of needles inserted. I had a biopsy, um, but that came back clear as well. And I'm ashamed to say it, especially given the family history, but because that biopsy was clear at 43, I didn't rush when I turned 45 to sign up for the breast screening program for the free mammograms. Um, then when I was 47, a very good friend of mine, Helena McAlpine, who was an advocate for the uh, Breast Cancer Foundation, she passed away. She was only in her 30s. And I sat at her funeral and I promised Helena that the very next day I would book my long overdue mammogram. And that's exactly what I did. Um, because of the previous scares and the fact that, you know, nothing had come of them, I went to the mammogram with no fear at all. Even when they called me back for a follow-up biopsy, I had no fear at all. Um, I had a wonderful um, nurse during that biopsy time because it's not particularly pleasant uh, having this sort of hole punch uh, done, um, but she was just so reassuring, so calm. She was actually very, very funny. Um, but when I went to my follow-up appointment um, where uh, Richard was there, um, the nurse came to get me to take my husband and I in to um, see Richard and to discuss the results. And she wouldn't look me in the eye and there was no joking around. And so Richard didn't really have to say much because I already had an inkling that things weren't great. But then Richard said, look, it's something called DCIS. And I didn't really know anything about that. I heard the word cancer. And again, I immediately thought the worst. But um, um Richard was very clear about explaining it, that it was treatable, that hopefully it hadn't um, spread. It, it was still contained, but that it was high grade because um, DCIS, I believe, can come in different you know, um, levels. Uh, it was high grade, so I didn't really want to take any risks um, with it potentially spreading. So uh, as soon as was, it was practical, um, I booked in for surgery. Another Thing that my wonderful friend Helena did before she passed away was convince me to get um, good medical insurance. 
and um, thankfully uh, that paid for my um, for my private surgery. Um, I did a little bit of Googling about DCIS in between seeing Richard and having my operation, and um, that probably wasn't a great idea. Um, I think uh, I did decide just to put my, my complete faith in the professionals and um, save any questions I had for, for follow-up appointments. Three days before Christmas 2015, I had my operation. Um, it's called a partial mastectomy, but, or a lumpectomy, but actually it was a very, very... I think minor thing. Um, I have a very small scar. I didn't need any reconstructive surgery. If if I didn't tell you, you would never have known that I'd had this operation. Everything seemed sort of evenly balanced. Um, and um, yeah, so so it was good. I hosted Christmas Day three days later for 14 people. Um, probably a foolish move. <laughs> Don't mix meds and champagne. I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> that was really not a good idea. Um, then in, oh, it was actually New Year's Eve. I was in a shopping mall and I got a text from Richard, who was somewhere in the middle of the, the Hauraki Gulf, to say the tests are back. Um, we've got it all, it hasn't spread, and I stood in the middle of the shopping mall crying and then went and bought some more champagne um, <laughs> to celebrate that night. And then I had radiotherapy to follow, uh, three weeks worth in about March, I think, March, April of 2016. Um, had some rather gnarly side effects from the radiotherapy, um, the exhaustion, which I was kind of expecting, but also my histamines went a little bit crazy. I kind of became itchy all over and... Um, uh, I started taking some lipospheric vitamin C and that seemed to put me on the right track again and, and some good um, uh, gut health stuff as well. Um, but really, uh, for all of that, uh, some people go, well, you're unlucky. You've had breast cancer or a form of early breast cancer. I think I'm really lucky. I think anyone that gets DCIS picked up, we are really, really lucky to have the system that we have, to have the mammogram uh, screening program and to be able to pick up things like DCIS um, before they become a real problem. Um, I have had a little scare in the last uh, six months or so um, in my other breast, um, but thanks to the good professionals, kept an eye on it, rechecked it again six months later, got the all clear, so never been more happy. And um, yeah, that's my story. Four years down the track, um, touching wood, completely fine. <laughs> that's great. <clears throat> Thank you so much, Lorna, for sharing that. We're now going to hear from Dr. Richard Harmon, who's a specialist breast and endocrine surgeon here in Auckland, and also a member of Breast Cancer Foundation's Medical Advisory Committee. Richard, there is a bit of confusion about DCIS. What is it and how do we treat it? Yes, so it's difficult. It's, um, it's sometimes, it, I think DCIS, it's, it's difficult for people because, you know, you came in expecting a diagnosis mm. of breast cancer, which it is breast cancer, but... Um, it's it's hard to explain to people that it is completely curable um, and put that in context when you're sitting there in a kind of cancer, breast cancer cl clinic. So I just want to try and explain a little bit more about it um, and obviously welcome any questions. But um, cancer is a is on a spectrum from very benign and then it's slow and, and to quite aggressive. And DCIS is... Uh, normal breast cells that have become abnormal and are growing out of control but they but they, they haven't they haven't got the ability to spread anywhere they haven't mutated enough to spread through the basement membrane of the ducts so um and because of that they ca it can't spread around the body so if we've got it at that stage it's completely curable by just the removal um and i'll go on to why we have to do other treatments as well so it's it, it's on a spectrum from completely benign um breast uh, conditions from uh, which start at uh, sort of atypia, then severe atypia, and then DCIS, and then in, invasive cancer. We have about 600 people diagnosed in New Zealand um, each year uh, with this condition. Um, it's usually found on a mammogram. You can't usually feel it. So it's, um, but I think yours was, uh, I think, Wally, you could feel yours. Is that no, right? no, 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 feel it at all. So we do see people with a lump uh, with DCIS, but uh, most of the time it's picked up on mammogram, and especially in the screening now, we see it very often, and usually it's a very, it's a, it's a very small area. Um, so you usually diagnose, you see some, we see some calcifications, which are not actually the cancer, but the result of the, the DCIS, which are the cells that are growing quite quickly, getting squashed together, and when cells die, they calcify, and that's what we're seeing on the mammogram. So we're not actually seeing the cancer, we're just seeing these calcifications. And then we do a biopsy, and the biopsy will tell us what that particular part of uh, the, 
the, the specimens we've got, whether it's whether it's DCIS or invasive cancer. But we can tell pathologists looks on the microscope and they see the cancer cells haven't gone through the duct, and that tells us that uh, the, the duct membrane that tells us that it's DCIS and not invasive cancer. Um, it can be treated by just removing that area. Uh, if it's a small area, then you just need surgery alone. If it's slightly larger, we give radiotherapy, and that's because for every DCIS or invasive cancer, there is usually some other cells that are abnormal within that breast. And so the radiotherapy um, treats the, the other abnormal cells in that breast. If it's tiny though, sort of five millimeters or 10 millimeters, we, we often don't give radiotherapy now uh, uh, for those. And indeed, we'll just, just, just watch those patients. Um, because of the size of it, sometimes it's quite a big, a big area of DCS, and therefore we can't just do what you had a lumpectomy mm -hmm. or a partial mastectomy, but to do uh, do a mastectomy, and that's just basically based on the size. It doesn't mean your DCS is any worse, or you're going to have any spread of the DCIS. If it's a larger area of DCIS or high grade, though, it can be some invasive cancer hidden inside that DCIS. So that's why sometimes we do a lymph node biopsy, and I think that might have been the case with you where it was a bigger area and that's why we don't know until we get it out completely that there's no invasive cancer so people get a bit confused why you're doing a lymph node biopsy that can't spread the only reason we do that is because hidden in that if it's a bigger area of DCAs there may be some invasive uh, cancer there so, so why do, you, why do we need to remove it if it's pre-cancer? And that's because a proportion of these, the D, not all DCIS goes on to form invasive cancer. About 30% do, but we don't know which ones do. So at the moment, we sort of treat everybody with DCIS. So, so some, we're actually probably over-treating a few people, um, but we, don't, we can't prove which ones not to. So it's a bit difficult. So we're better to be safe than sorry. Um, and what else have we got there that... So generally, yeah, we will remove it nice and early. Um, and about 30% of the time when we remove what we thought was DCAs, we do find some invasive cancer there. And then it's not DCAs, it's actually invasive cancer, so you're treated in that way. So until we get it all out, we can't be sure that there's no invading cancer there, which is why some of you, it sort of adds to the confusion of the whole thing as well, actually. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm, hopefully I'm not confusing you too much. Um, so most of the time, um, DCS is fairly small because it's picked up on screening and we treat the majority with uh, partial mastectomy or lumpectomy and if you've had that though we've got to give radiotherapy to sterilize the rest of the breast tissue and that's about it's, uh, it takes place over a period of about three weeks um, and every day five days a week treatment and that will that really decreases the rate of recurrence um, to almost close to zero and that's why we give radiotherapy. Um, there's a lot of research going on, and this is interesting at the moment, um, there's a lot of research going on at the moment into DCAS because as I said, not all of them are, people are gonna go on and form, form a cancer. So there are trials now just looking at for low grade DCAS, there's one based in Australia and one in the, the United Kingdom that are up on the slide there where we're actually observing people with low risk DCAs rather than giving them um, treatment. So they've just been observed and seeing if they develop anything. That's a sort of fairly early, at an early stage at the moment, it's certainly not standard treatment. Some people do elect not to have uh, uh, surgery uh, and so uh, we follow them, um, but the majority of people go down the sort of uh, conservative route of undergoing surgery and having their, their full treatment. So what's the, the future of DCIS is that at the moment we treat everybody, but it's likely that we'll be able to do biopsies. This isn't here yet, but we'll be able to analyze the genomics of the tumor and work out whether we need to do anything or not. So we'll, um, from the biopsy, and then we'll say, well, you're someone we could observe or you're someone we need to treat. And that's the future, but it's not here yet. So unfortunately, we have to treat everyone at the moment. And, uh, yeah, I think that's it for me. I'm probably oh no, like okay, I've got one more. Um, so if you've just had DCS, such as Lorna did, uh, she's cured from that based on the fact that it's been removed and the rest of the breast has been treated with uh, uh, radiotherapy. So the chance of having 
uh, a recurrence in that breast is, is pretty low, it's possible, but it would likely be another one forming within the breast, which is why we've given you the radiotherapy to treat any other abnormal cells in that breast. Um, if you, once you've had DCIS, we keep a careful eye on you. You're seen annually for a mammogram, ultrasound usually, uh, if you're a bit younger as well. And we're also not looking at only the breast we treated, but also the other breast, because there's a risk to the other breast. And in some ways, you are almost better off than someone who's never been diagnosed with DCIS, mm -hmm. because you you know you've got something that's cured, but you're keeping a careful eye on your breasts on the other side, and so are the so is everybody else, the the radiologists and the surgeons, keep a close eye on that. So. Uh, in some ways, it's uh, it's a little wake up call. Could, could be there, but you're cured. And so, if you think of it like that, it's not such a bad thing. And, uh, and it's you're, you're in, under very close surveillance. Um, we usually will find anything um, pretty early on if if you've got DCIS, and then we'll be able to treat that uh, jump in pretty early. Um, as it is, almost all even invasive cancers, the the cure rate is getting up into the ninety percent now. So. Um, it, it, it allows us to pick any recurrence up early, and if we did find, if you did develop a cancer within that same breast, which is unlikely, it's very likely it will be cured anyway. So. Great, okay, thank you so much, Richard. That was extremely informative for everybody out there. Um, don't forget to use the chat box if you'd like to ask any questions or talk to other people who are sitting in tonight. Our last speaker is Nurse Melissa Warren. Uh, Melissa is a specialist breast care nurse who works for us here at Breast Cancer Foundation now. She helps support DCIS patients on one of our uh, support programs, which she'll tell you about during her presentation. Melissa, tell us what happens when someone's diagnosed with DCIS. Thanks, Adele. Um, what you may be feeling at the time of diagnosis is often described by women as mixed emotions. In fact, it can be feelings of shock, fear, worry that intertwine often with belief when told that this is a very early form of breast cancer and has a very good prognosis, a really good outcome. So that can be really quite confusing, um, trying to get your head around that information and also the treatment that is recommended um, for DCIS. Often women describe a real conflict um, being told in one instance that they may be required to have a mastectomy for a very early form of breast cancer and trying to get your head around that and make sense of that. It's really important um, to describe and express how you're feeling. Um, often women describe feeling a little bit like I shouldn't be really complaining. Um, I, you know, this has been poor early it's got a very good outcome, I'm not needing to have chemotherapy. But it's really important to acknowledge how you're feeling, talk to your breast care nurse um, and also your specialist team, and also talk to um, loved ones, family, um, friends, who can really support you at this time. And I think it's really important to also acknowledge um, at the point of diagnosis, you will be appointed a breast care nurse and they're a good point of contact and support um, from diagnosis throughout your treatment and beyond um, follow-up care as well. So let's just look, look a little bit at surgery and what to expect before surgery. And I think it's really important to acknowledge um, for some women um, coming into hospital for an operation may be a first time experience. And that's not often without its worry um, and feelings of apprehension. And again, I just really want to stress you'll be well supported um, by your breast care nurse um, before surgery and after surgery, and of course your um, surgical team as well. So anyone requiring uh, an operation um, for DCIS uh, will be required to come in for a pre-assessment appointment. And essentially this is an outpatient appointment, normally one to two weeks um, prior to your surgery. And this will involve taking an overall view of your health, um, checking what medications you're taking, any allergies, and you will also undergo some tests. And these will include a chest X-ray, an ECG to check your heart function and some blood tests. And this is essentially to prepare you for your anaesthetic and your surgery. And it's a really um, good opportunity also at this appointment um, to discuss and revisit any um, additional questions you may have um, regarding um, your surgery. 
Now, for women, um, often, um, because DCIS can't be felt, um, often women are required to have a localisation. Um, and this is a procedure that often takes place possibly um, usually a day before surgery or in some cases on um, the day of surgery. Now, this is a procedure that's um, undertaken um, by radiologists and it's usually under uh, mammogram or ultrasound guidance and you will have a local anaesthetic applied and they will insert um, a very fine hook wire um, into the area of the DCIS um, to really mark the precise area that's going to be removed um, during surgery. So just to be aware of that, and again, you'll be provided with information regarding that procedure and lead up um, to your surgery. In terms of uh, length of time um, in hospital, for those having breast conserving surgery, so wide local excision or lumpectomy, um, this is usually as a day case, um, involves you coming in in the morning, often early morning start, and then going home at the end of the day. For those having a mastectomy, um, it's usually an overnight stay, and I think it's really important to also stress, um, you might, some women might require further recovery time, and that clearly will be met and discussed with you and your specialist team if you need further um, time in hospital. So what to expect after surgery? And I think it's really important to first of all say that most people recover really well um, following surgery um, with very few uh, major side effects. But there's some things that um, you need to be aware of um, just so you know what to expect um, following surgery. So you will have a wound dressing. Um, these are usually an adhesive dressing um, to um, cover the wound, keep it dry and clean. Um, depending on what type of surgery you have, you may also have a drain, and this is to drain away um, any fluid um, that accumulates in the surrounding tissues um, around um, the wound. And you will be given um, really good information on how to manage your wound dressings and drain um, prior to discharge um, home. Pain and discomfort is commonly experienced and you may find when you come um, out of surgery and you're back on the ward that you might have a little um, machine um, that's linked to a drip in your arm. It's called a PCA, which stands for Patient Controlled um, Analgesia. And um, basically you press a little button and that will provide um, continuous pain relief. And you often will have that in place while you're in hospital. And prior to discharge, you'll um, have that removed and then be um, commenced on tablet form pain relief to keep your pain and discomfort well managed and controlled. Bruising and swelling is quite common, particularly in days following the surgery. Some women may develop a seroma. Um, this is a collection of fluid um, on the breast or on the chest wall or sometimes under the arm and it can feel quite wobbly to touch and quite swollen. Um, again, we normally let the body resolve that and it just reabsorbs um, in time. As with any type of operation, um, infection is always a potential risk. And so we do recommend um, to be aware of um, signs and symptoms or signs of infection. And particularly when you're at home, if you have any concerns around infection, fever, pink, um, hot, um, do contact your breast care nurse or specialist team straight away. Hematoma is another potential um, side effect after effective surgery, and this is essentially like internal bruising, um, it's a collection of blood in the surrounding tissues around the wound. It can often feel very hard um, to touch and quite uncomfortable, and again, we just wait for the body um, for that to settle down and resolve in its own time. There's other potential um, side effects to be aware of that may occur further down the line following surgery, such as swelling, um, lymphedema, cording, maybe a loss of sensation, temporary um, pins and needles. Um, again, you'll be given good information um, following um, going home and at follow-up as well. I think it's really important to acknowledge every woman um, will recover at a different time um, and it involves both healing both physically and emotionally. 
So let's just briefly look at radiation therapy, um, as mentioned already. Uh, this is given to women who have had um, either a wide local excision or um, lumpectomy. Uh, this usually commences usually four to six weeks after surgery. And the reason for this time um, lapse is to give you good sufficient time to recover um, following surgery, but also to give you um, time to regain good arm movement following your surgery. Um, before you leave hospital, I should say you will be seen um, by a physiotherapist and they will go through some um, exercises with you. And it's really important um, that you regain good uh, range of movement in your arm and shoulder, particularly if you are having radiation therapy, because you will be required to lift your arm above um, your head um, when you come to have radiation therapy. The common um, time frame for radiation therapy is three weeks, and that's Monday to Friday with the break at the weekend. Some hospitals around the country may deliver it over five weeks um, and in terms of efficacy it's the same. It will be very much down to your local hospital and their radiation um, protocols. So just to be aware of some potential side effects of radiation therapy, um, skin reactions can commonly occur and these do range. Um, it may be a darkening of the skin, the skin becomes a little bit more pinker. Um, there might be some dryness, um, there may be some moisture or blistering, but again, you'll be well managed by your radiotherapy team in terms of um, assessing any skin reactions that you may um, experience and also management of those. Swelling of the breast, um, some pain and discomfort can be commonly experienced during and at the end of treatment. Um, a lot of these side effects can be accumulative, so just to be aware of that, and again, they will be managed those symptoms um, that you have. Fatigue and tiredness is a big um, side effect of radiation therapy, and women often describe that this becomes more heightened as they near the end of their treatment and on completion. So just to be aware of that, and it could take several weeks um, for that, possibly months, um, before you return to normal energy levels. Of course, there's other um, changes to be aware of um, in terms of change in breast shape, size, and color, and there may be a potential for swelling and lymphedema, but again, you'll be managed well by um, your radiotherapy team. So lastly, you've come to the end of your treatment, and it's about moving forward after treatment. And often, women describe this as being really mixed emotions, uh, relief, happiness um, that treatment has finally uh, finished, but also uncertainty about the future and perhaps moving forward and how do they move forward. As Richard has um, mentioned already, um, conventional um, follow-up for DCIS is over five years, and this is um, with an annual um, mammogram and any other recommended um, imaging that you might require. It's really important to support you moving forward after treatment um, to live healthy, um, staying active, exercise. Um, there's really compelling evidence to show that this can um, uh, reduce um, recurrence, but also eating well, maintaining a healthy weight. These are all things that you can do to help um, move forward after treatment um, and improve overall um, well-being and, um, and health. So I just want to finish on some support services I just want to bring your attention to. Um, here at the Breast Cancer Foundation, um, we provide a number of support services um, for women who have been treated for DCIS, and this is during and um, after treatment. Uh, we have a team of nurses who provide a free 0800 advice line, and this is a contact um, advice line available to anyone um, who you can bring um, Monday to Friday, and we can provide information, um, support, and also refer on as required to specialist services that you may need. We also have my MyBC app, and this is a fantastic online community for women affected um, by um, breast cancer, and it's a great way to connect with one another, share experience and support. We also provide other outreach um, community um, services closer to home to you. Uh, we fund physical rehabilitation, and this is one-on-one -on -one with the physiotherapist. Um, and it's again about um, helping you to move forward after treatment, regaining strength after surgery and treatment. 
We also provide funding for counselling and the 16s to loved ones as well. If you're struggling or needing just some extra help to look at strategies for um, managing um, emotions and moving forward after treatment. We also fund um, lymphedema, lymphedema therapy. Um, again, this is something that can be provided closer to home to you as well. And um, it's really key if you do suspect you have got um, lymphedema to contact um, your breast care nurse or your specialist um, team. They can make a referral um, to us here at the Breast Cancer Foundation or you can self-refer it. And early intervention assessment is key um, for lymphedema, keeping it mild and uncomplicated. And lastly, I just want to highlight an exciting uh, service that we've just launched at the end of last year. Um, this was a new way of following up patients um, treated for early breast cancer and DCIS. We are working in partnership with Mid Central District Health Board um, in Palmerston North, and we're now providing a service for women, which is very much focusing on them and their wellness to support them to move forward after DCIS. So it's very much shifting away from perhaps conventional follow-up where it's very focused on disease, it's very much now focused on well-being. It, do, it does still include um, annual surveillance, um, mammograms and other imaging that you might require, but it's very much putting you at the centre of your follow-up and you determining your supportive care needs. And this is a service that we provide via um, telehealth um, services. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Melissa. And in fact, thanks to all three of you. Melissa, could you pass that gauge yes. down to me, please? Thank you. Um, we're now going to open up to some questions from you at home. We've got a few sitting here, but there's still um, time for more. So please do go ahead and type your questions in the chat box and we will get through as many as we can in the time available. So I'll just uh, look through these and, and hand them out to the appropriate people. Okay, so here's someone who's asked, are there any figures on how many women who've had a single mastectomy after DCIS go on to have the other breast removed and why did they choose that? I'm deliberating this at the moment as I'm not happy with the outcome from my surgery six months ago. I think Richard might give you that one. Um. So sorry, the the say it again. But so one. why do people maybe go on to have another the other breast removed after their initial okay. mastectomy? So it sounds like DCI, elective, yes. elective yeah. surgery. Yeah. So um, well, the reason to do that would I mean one of one of the common reasons we might do that is if if we find uh, the patient obviously has another another problem another problem in the other breast, obviously we'd want to treat that, but uh, sometimes people we discover that people have got a genetic risk. Um, and that they're at high risk of developing cancer. So that, that would, would make us uh, maybe counsel that patient into having a, a mastectomy on the other side. But sometimes, uh, emotional reasons as well, people can't cope with the fact that they may develop another cancer in the other breast, um, even though the risk is very low. And if you've had a mastectomy for DCAS and it was purely DCAS, you, you are cured um, from that. So uh, the risk on the other side is a little bit more than the normal population, but that, as we've as I've talked about previously, um, you know, we're screening, we'll be screening your other breast uh, well, and we should pick up anything nice and early. But if you're at increased risk through family or genetic predisposition, then that's a very reasonable reason to do that. I, the the question said they weren't happy with their surgery. I, I, it's hard for me to know what that means. It, if they feel unbalanced or then that would be a re something to to think about doing doing that for the patient if they really wanted it. Um, but then, of course, you, they may want to consider reconstruction, um, which we, we would like to be able to offer anyone who wanted uh, breast reconstruction if they're having a mastectomy uh, to that to the patient. Mm. Great, thank you. And here's a comment from someone: I wish I'd been told that I might get lymphedema and what to expect. How common is lymphedema after? DCIS. Lymphedema should be very uncommon after mm. DCIS because um, the only reason to that we take a lymph node out is if we are suspecting that there could be some invasive cancer there. So if you've got high-grade DCIS uh, or it's a big area of DCIS, then we would check a lymph node because it may be hidden in the breast as a cancer and looking an invading cancer and, and a very good way of checking that it hasn't gone anywhere is to check a lymph node. 
the, the risk of lymphedema with uh, sentinel node biopsy is pretty low, uh, much lower than if you have uh, uh, axillary node dissection. I think um, from the studies, it was, it's around about uh, less than 10% anyway, and yeah, it's right. usually it's fairly right. mild. Mm -hmm. um, I can't give you the exact figure, but 8% mm -hmm. seems to ring a bell with me. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, the lymphedema should be very uncommon. In pre previous, uh, I guess this is, and we're doing less auxiliary surgery for this sort of thing now than we used to. Uh, maybe 10 years ago, uh, it was more common to do more auxiliary surgery, take out more lymph nodes than we do now. But mm -hmm. The risk of lymphedema and DCA should be should be very low. Mona, did anyone talk to you about lymphedema? Nope. <laughs> <laughs> no, they did not. Um, yeah. And did you have a sentinel node biopsy? No, no, they just said, okay, well, that'd be why. <laughs> we generally wouldn't talk to anyone. No. Um, I thought it was up there. <laughs> <laughs> no, there was no uh, but, need for but, but um, yeah, I mean, with uh, if, if if you're not doing axillary surgery, then there should be no no reason yeah. to talk about lymphedema. Yeah, and, totally um, agree. We, we do we did we didn't used to um, talk about lymphedema much with sentinel node biopsy. We, we didn't think it caused that much. That was the reason yeah. to move from axillary dissection to sentinel node biopsy. But now we generally tend to measure everyone's um, biomedics in their arm to check that they haven't got lymphedema. Mm. Um, Melissa, a couple of side effect questions that might yes. be good for you. Um, discoloration and loss of sensation of nipple, is this a side effect of radiation? Yeah, um, it normally is. Um, sometimes a loss of sensation might be um, a temporary side effect following surgery, but more so probably commonly associated with radiotherapy. It is temporary, but it may take time to settle down. So it's initially, you know, essentially sort of nerves, nerve endings, um, where it may be felt as numbness or pins and needles. Yes, we have another question actually from someone who says she has a lightly painful tingling sensation in the nipple. Um, would that again be radiation? Or she's asking if that might be just nerve damage or something. Yeah, I mean, it could be either. It depends yeah, where the surgery. surgery's been. So if you interrupt the nerves to the nipple, yeah. you could cause that, um, mm -hmm. which is common if, if 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 the surgery was around the nipple. We would hope in time that it would settle down, but it may take several weeks um, following surgery. And obviously, radiotherapy on top of that, if they have radiotherapy, that might be even more heightened. Um, right. The pins and needles and the discomfort. Mm -hmm. Mm. Like you say, it usually settles down. Yeah, it usually settles down. It's too pre. Right. Okay. Um, I guess someone who says, I didn't have a local anesthetic for my hook wires and I ended up having four. Is that uncommon? Mm. <laughs> I hope so. Oh, yes. <laughs> yes I, I definitely had a local for mine. I, I don't know. Yeah, I, I, I think people would always have a local yes. anesthetic. Maybe the local anesthetic didn't work, um, but you, you would expect definitely to have a local anesthetic. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Especially having four. Yeah. The general yeah. anesthetic. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 I'm sorry. Sorry that you had to go through that. If, uh, if mm. that's the case, I think. Must have been quite unpleasant. Mm. Um, there's someone who says, I was 41 when diagnosed with intermediate grade DCIS, no other family history of breast cancer. Is there any increased risk for my 14 year old daughter? 41. Um, <sighs> If it's if you're the only person with breast cancer, then there's you, your her risk is only slightly increased. So it's um, she should just start breast screening at at, at the age of forty. Mm -hmm. So start her mammograms then. But the risk is only very small. If any other first degree or second degree relatives, you know, like uh, another um, her aunt or um, her grandmother um, develops breast cancer, then yes, she would have to be slightly more. She'd be at a moderate risk, but she still wouldn't be at high risk unless there was another close relative less than 50. Mm -hmm. If she's at moderate risk, would, she, would you expect the same thing to start at 40 and have the regular screening? Yeah, well, you, you never know, but we generally like to start if, they're at, if, if they've got an increased risk, generally start screening at the age that the, um, the relative got cancer or, right. or five years before, if possible. Right. But, it's probably not much point starting mammographic screening before the age of 40. No. If they're at really high risk and they're genetically high risk, then we start screening earlier and we actually start with MRI screening as well. Mm -hmm. But yeah, that, for this, for this particular person, mm -hmm. that they wouldn't be 
at a hugely amount more, mm. at least another relative, or they found someone else that yeah. developed breast cancer. Having two daughters, I was interested in that <laughs> question too. So yeah. yes, and and yeah. the only other thing I'd say about family history is make sure that you know the family history. On it's not just on the mother's side; there may be um, mother. women on your on your yeah. husband's side or on the on the daughter's father's and, side that um, mm. had breast cancer. And it can skip a generation yes. too. So mm. it might be your parents were okay, but the grandparents and it could be a whole cluster there, and it's skipped. And similarly, if ovarian cancer and prostate cancer have been mm. common in the family, those would be other things to, to consider looking yes. at genetic screening for. Yeah. Um, okay, uh, let's see what we've got here. Is it normal to still have twinges of subtle pain at the incision site six months after DCIS surgery? And they've had radiotherapy presented for Mm. Yes, it is. Almost everyone has a few twinges, and especially when they come to have their follow-up mammogram. So I think uh, Lorne probably attest to that. You've yeah. got a few twinges. Yeah, twinges. yeah, yeah. It's no, not common. not now, but yeah, certainly in that first year, and especially approaching that first mammogram, yeah, yeah, yeah you get yeah. this sort of nervous. But um, yeah, I think it just goes on, and I'm absolutely no nothing there now. But mm. yeah, it's probably yeah. normal. Right. Um, Okay, it's a long question, I'll just come back to that. Um, and then a question similarly maybe about numbness after mastectomy. How long does that take to disappear? Um, well, the, do you want to? Yeah, I mean, I think, <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, it can vary from person to person, to be perfectly honest, and it might take several months, and that can be short months or long months. and. Sorry to seem so vague, but it is very variable, um, and it does normally settle down, and again, it is the nerve endings, um, essentially, that are resulting in any sort of discomfort or uh, numbness or loss of sensation or pins and needles, and it is ranging, um, you know, it could be six months, it could be 12 months, possibly longer, would you I say? I mean, it, it can be permanent because some of the cutaneous nerves come through um, the skin, right. to, to, you know, through, through from the rib cage out through, into the skin, and we have to divide that to remove the breast or especially lymph nodes. So often most people get used to that numbness, though, mm -hmm. and, and they don't. It's not something they complain about for a long time, especially, like, if, if you do anything under the armpit, central node biopsy, or axillary mm -hmm. dissection, you will cause that it's... It's going to be yeah, there, but well. people sort of get used to it. And I think this, mm -hmm. and the breast is not something that people I've had complain about for a long time after right. this. Um, right. They probably do yeah, re yeah, but I right. think they, so on the mastectomy flaps, I think you re that. Yeah. yeah. Well, now, someone's asking, uh, if she, well, actually, I think she had 10 nodes removed, so it's probably more an invasive cancer yeah. question. We might just pop back to that if we get time towards the end. Um, Right, I've had treatment for DCIS with three weeks radiation, and now I find two years later I have two more small calcifications. At this stage, they are stable, but how would you treat these new ones? They're in the same breast. Um, it depends what sort of calcifications they are. So, uh, as I was saying, calcifications are not actually the cancer. They are um, they're usually dead tissue, and that can be a cyst or a benign thing or malignant calcifications. So the radiologist um, or the breast clinic you're at will say whether they're worried about those calcifications because there's some that are completely benign, and it's okay to watch them. If they are at all suspicious, then a biopsy should be done. Which, so if they're, if they're saying they're okay, they're, they're likely they're, they're okay. Um, and they'll want to watch them. And they may watch them in three months or six months, do another follow-up mammogram, usually in six months if they think they're benign. And if they change, then they'll biopsy them. If they haven't changed, they'll probably continue to observe them. Yeah. Because the calcifications themselves are not the cancer. They're just a reflection of something going on in the breast. Um, it's, uh, if we had a way of knowing exactly what the calcification would be nice, but we don't. We have to biopsy those calcifications if we're worried. And if you're extremely worried, then the thing to do is just to ask for a biopsy and get it checked out, and then it stops all that worry. Because right. it's quite stressful. Oh, I've got some calcifications. I'm going to, you know, come back in six months for another. Oh, is it changed or not? But if you, you know, if you take it out, if you just get a little biopsy done, you know, it's all right and you're good. Right. Good. 
Great. Now, um, a question that was sent earlier. Can you tell me the time you can expect internal healing to be complete? I'd like to get moving and exercising more than just walking, but I'm worried I may not be healed enough for this. Melissa, would you like to give a view on that? Yeah, yeah. Um, again, that will vary from person to person, but you, you are looking at... Uh, months and it, it could be a good six months before you really feel like um, you're at a point where you're sort of ready to participate in real active physical exercise. I mean we do promote exercise um, you know following our treatment for DCIS but it does take time to heal and um, yeah I'd be looking at it six months. Would you? Yeah. Yeah, the, the um, well, the most of the eighty percent of the healing in, in, uh, when, is, is done at six weeks. So you've got quite a good strength there, but you so you can start doing most things at six weeks. Yeah. Um, the healing's right. pretty good, but um, six months it'll be well and truly healed. But mm -hmm. uh, six, six weeks is eighty percent healed. It takes a little. The sort of healing curve goes up quite quickly to six weeks, and then takes a long, quite a long time. So maybe it does stretch out to six months to get it fully healed, but. After six weeks, you can do most things. Be happy with patients yeah. running and exercising yeah. and that yeah, sort of thing. Yeah, yeah, six yeah. weeks. Yeah. yeah. Then if you have the radiotherapy, I mean, there's obviously a bit of a yeah. knockback there. But then yeah. after that, then yeah. yeah when I did you get back to full? Um, probably about two weeks. <laughs> <laughs> I was I was pretty good actually after my surgery, but after the radiotherapy, probably about. Uh, a month after the radiotherapy ended was when I felt fully, you know, okay. I could go so running. Probably and, like yeah. three months. Three after months. Yes. Yeah, yeah, about three months, and, and felt completely back to normal. Yeah. So, but and I think it does vary because obviously, very, obviously. obviously um, fatigue and tiredness and lethargy, particularly following radiation therapy, mm -hmm. can vary for people. And so, yeah, but you're right. I think six weeks is sort of the gold standard in terms mm -hmm. of internal healing. Um, but again, it's individual, isn't it, in terms mm -hmm. of. Um, and radiotherapy mm. does delay that healing a bit too. Mm. So six weeks is what we say for most of the types of surgery, surgery. Um, but radiotherapy yeah, does delay that. And I can imagine a full mastectomy as opposed to a lumpectomy yeah. is a different kettle of yes. fish as well. So, and then they've yeah. got, so potentially after you've had a mastectomy, you can get fluid collecting their seroma, and so that's a little bit more. Mm. Most people are back up and running after about six weeks. Mm -hmm. So the, the physiotherapy that we fund here at Breast Cancer Foundation, which Melissa mentioned, that's a uh, one-on-one -on -one mm. service. Um, so that does actually help mm. you regain your individual strength at your, your pace quite well. Um, now, question, um, if DCIS isn't picked up by a mammogram, can I opt for ultrasound instead? Mine wasn't picked up. I had a discharge from the nipple. Um, ultrasound, no, most DCIS is... Uh, shows up as calcification, so ultrasound will pick up calcification, but not nearly in the same way that mammography will. So not really. Ultrasound's not too too good at that, really. Ultrasound will pick up a mass and bigger calcifications, but it's not good for calcifications. Mm -hmm. If you had nipple discharge, then that is a sign there's something going wrong there. Um, so yeah, you would. It, would have been, um, I guess, picked up through the what was in the discharge, and then you would have had an ultrasound as well to check that out. And 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 although this lady felt the DCIS isn't picked up by a mammogram, in fact, that's how most DCIS is found. So, yeah. so um, I mean, through the breast perfect, through the breast good. screening program, the, you know, we pick up a lot of DCIS there, mm -hmm. which is good. I mean, that's what it's for to pick up very early breast cancer. Mm -hmm. Here's someone says, I was suggested not to wear underwire bras after DCIS. Any reason for that, do you think? No, oh, I wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> Something else you forgot did to I tell me, Richard. <laughs> 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 yeah. um, no, there's no, no real strong recommendation regarding that. I think it's absolutely fine. Um, I think it I comes down to surgery. comfort. It might mm. come down to comfort and certainly sort of within those first oh, six weeks post-surgery. Post post-surgery, yes. Yeah, post-surgery. Mm. Um, but sort of beyond that six point, um, six week point after surgery, um, if you are someone that does wear a wire underwire bra, um, there would be no reason why you can't. Um, but yeah, it'd wait until sufficient recovery from surgery yeah. and you know, plus minus radiotherapy mm -hmm. if they've had radiotherapy mm -hmm. as well. You'll know if it's not comfortable. Yeah, <laughs> no, not well, that's right. I guess that's a mm -hmm. pretty good clue that it's not working for mm -hmm. you. Um, here's what it says, after discovering DCIS had, had become invasive cancer, 
it was just suggested that a lymph node biopsy take place. This caused pain, stinging sensation from the center of the chest to the elbow. Is there a general timeline for this to be to to write itself? And is this something you've come across before? After the central node biopsy. So. Um, yes. Yes. So I presume what happened in this case of the lumpectomy was done and they found some invasive cancer and then yes. decided to do a central node biopsy. Mm -hmm. And that's to check whether that, any of that invasive cancer that they didn't know about before has spread to the lymph node and then you might need more treatment. Generally, things from a central node biopsy settle down relatively quickly. The, in that area under the armpit, there are quite a lot of cutaneous nerves that run there. If they've been cut or um, sometimes you have to cut them to get the lymph node out or um, that any of them, they could, could result in some ongoing pain for a while. Very rarely do they need sort of um, pain management with uh, the odd patient will need if they've got ongoing pain um, to see someone in the pain clinic uh, to get onto amitriptyline or nortriptyline or gabapentin even, sort of stronger painkillers. So, or there could be an ongoing issue with the collection of fluid or even low-grade infection there. So pay just to talk to your surgeon and um, just check that none of those things are, are going on. Generally, after a central node biopsy and the resolves, again, it's usually pretty well settled down by two to, two to six weeks. Okay. Um, let me see what else we've got here. Um, okay, yes, the lady with the central node biopsy just says it's been 12 months um, since she had it and radiation made the pain a lot worse. Yeah, well, I, that's unusual. Um, so there may well be something going on there. Um, it, it's very hard to say without what, what it is, yeah. but that it, it may well be, if it's a sharp stabbing pain, um, it, well, it may well be nerve pain, a nerve ending that's, uh, and you've got, a neuroma going on there that's, that could be quite sore. Um, so you'd have to have a look at that and see someone with, um, with a pain interest to try and settle that down or, and do some, you know, good get some good uh, images, radiology images, make sure there's nothing um, going on in that area that can be fixed. Because you should be having a lot of pain after 12 months, it's not yeah. right. It should be telling that back to so You surgeon. need to feed that back yeah. to your surgeon and um, yeah. see what they can do for you. Right. Now, um, the lady who had 10 nodes removed, one of which was cancerous, she said she asked if she is more susceptible to infections now. She had a breast infection that, that led to that had surgery after her DCIS. Am I going to get more infections now having had nodes removed? Um, not just because you've had nodes removed, but you certainly, if you've had lymph nodes removed, you're more susceptible to lymphedema. In the arm, swelling of the arm, so she, you should certainly get that checked. And if you've got lymphedema, you are more susceptible to infection in the arm and, and the breast, I guess, if you've already had an infection. Because what the lymphedema is, it's just a lot of fluid that shouldn't be there in the tissues, and that can sometimes harbour infection. So it's best to try and reduce that, that, that lymphedema. But I'm not sure, she didn't say she got lymphedema, but just because you've had lymph nodes removed doesn't necessarily. Um, mean you're going to get infections. So if you wanted to, if you were worried about that, then the best thing to do would just to ask your um, rescue nurse or surgeon to measure your um, uh, arm, arm for lymphedema and just examine you for lymphedema of the breast as well. So if you haven't got that, I don't think you're at high risk of infection. Right, okay. Now a question about um, radiotherapy. I had a mammogram in May, DCIS surgery in June and another surgery in July because not enough clear margins. Um, what month will I be called back for my mammogram? Diagnosis so, was when? In, in, in May. Second surgery was in July. So generally I'd recall when that, at the time of first diagnosis but it doesn't really matter um, mm -hmm. but it's often a good time for patients to remember when they have their mammograms that they can remember the time, the date they were diagnosed and then it's an annual it's an annual time, but if it's a month, uh, a couple of months, either side, it doesn't really matter, you know. But it's just a, a time to to look at doing it. So the date you can remember best would be the one for the yeah, time to, yeah. to have your, your mammogram. Right, and she also says I opted not to have radiotherapy, even though it was high grade, as the risks of radiotherapy seemed to outweigh the benefits, as the chance of recurrence wasn't that much lower with the radiotherapy. What's your view on that? 
Yeah, so what we do is, um, depending on the, it's not, it's not a blanket rule that everyone has radiotherapy. So there is a scoring index that we use called the Van Nuys Prognostic Index, um, and that measures the size of the tumor, um, the margin that the surgeon's got around the tumor and the grade, the grade of the tumor. And we put all of that together and gives us a score, and that gives us a sort of an, an idea of how, how much the radiotherapy will reduce the chance of recurrence. So maybe you had a small tumor and a good margin around it, and the chance of recurrence was only um, sort of five percent, and then the radio radiotherapy will only halve that, so you're only getting a two and a half percent benefit. So you probably wouldn't go for it because of the side effects. So um, that's sort of how it's decided. Right. Um, Melissa, a question for you. Can mammograms damage breast tissue and increase the risk of getting breast cancer? Right, um, no. Um, so um, mammograms are really your best um, form of early detection and detecting any changes. And as part of your follow-up um, following um, DCIS, um, it is the recommended surveillance um, imaging that we use. Um, in some cases, we might um, use other imaging, um, MRI scan or ultrasound as well. Um, often in women with um, young women with dense breasts, um, MRI um, scans might be indicated, um, but they do not uh, increase your risk. Is that the question also yeah, yeah, regarding getting breast cancer? No. Okay. Can biopsies damage tissue and increase the risk of cancer spreading? No, we don't think so. It damages tissue because you're going in and mm -hmm. taking a bit of it out, um, but that tissue generally heals out uh, fairly well, and you're not usually having multiple biopsies. Um, so just a biopsy to diagnose the cancer or you know, to check that something else is all right is not likely to cause cancer. And if you hit risk, has to be done. Really, and it has to be done. Yeah, to find out what's no going on. So, yeah. um, there's no evidence that biopsies cause cancer. Mm. Okay, someone who's asking if her sons are at extra risk of breast cancer, male breast cancer. If if you've got the gene um, for breast cancer, then yes, male breast cancer is part of that as well. If you're a BRCA one, BRCA two, but. Um, uh, just gen generally, no, not if you're just a one-off. So you'd want to just check if your family history is extremely strong or there's a history of strong history of ovarian cancer as well or prostate cancer and passed down the male side, then, and, and you've got a, a, an indication that you may be a genetic carrier, then yes, they would be at increased risk, mm -hmm. but not generally if you just had breast cancer um, it's a, and it's a one-off or there's only one or two family members with breast cancer. No, they wouldn't be. Great. I think we've just got one more question, um, which Melissa, you've kind of covered already, but it wouldn't hurt to re-emphasize about preventing recurrence of DCIS. Or yeah, I mean, certainly there's um, compelling evidence to show that um, exercise, um, being active, um, can reduce um, recurrence. Um, um, in terms of nutrition and diet, um, the research is a little bit hazy around that in terms of um, reducing recurrence. Um, I think we do recommend in terms of healthy living um, is to maintain a healthy weight um, and, and have a good diet, um, alcohol consumption and, and moderation. Um, and you know, all those things can help um, support well-being and um, general well-being. Um, but but uh, research to date has shown that exercise and being active may, and it's a big may, but certainly has shown to date that it uh, may reduce the uh, occurrence. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, so I think we're all done on the questions there. Um, if you do have any further questions, you can call our breast care nurses and the number's there on your screen. And as Melissa mentioned, we do have our online community to help you connect with other people who've been through the same, same journey that you have. Um, so that's it for tonight. Thank you very much to all of our speakers who have been wonderful. And thank you to all you at home who participated and, and asked questions and kept us on our toes. That was great. Um, the webinar will be 
on our website tomorrow should be and we'll be emailing out a link to you so if you missed part of it or all of it don't worry you'll, you'll get that link through to watch when you leave the webinar you will have the chance to complete an exit survey it's very quick and we'd really appreciate if you could do that and our time is up so that's it from us thank you good night good night good night okay.